Whistling Five Anarchic Productions proudly presents Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories As told by Andrew Brammer Hello and welcome. The story you are about to hear is written and told using its original source materials. Scribblings and scratchings from the scrawls of Stumpy found within Stumpy Sanderson's time capsule, which was buried in 1979 and then unearthed in 2019. The story is told in the first person, as I, just like Stumpy, witnessed at first hand the momentous events which it recounts. So let's park up our rally choppers and tomahawks and take a ride back to 1978 for Bendy's Big Catch. Taking a last drag on our John Player Blues and passing the parked Hillman Hunter, which told us the vicar was round for his usual and regular meeting with Bendy Henderson's father, Stumpy Sanderson and I strolled down Bendy Henderson's concrete driveway in our junior Doc Martins and Susie and the Banshee's button badges to rat-a-tat-tat on the dark front door. After a few moments, Mr Henderson himself answered, looming large and forbidding, staring down at us with heavy brows and looking with saturnine disapproval at our hedgehog head forms. He's up in his room, he said, and we duly scuttled up the stairs. Hi Bendy, how's it feel? One day from freedom, we grinned, bursting into his room. For this was indeed the last night of Bendy's latest grounding, and, as an unusual act of clemency by his father, was the first time we had been allowed round to see him since that fateful evening almost a month ago. That fateful evening, when punishment had been gravely handed down to Bendy for an offence which his father had solemnly declared represented exactly the type of behaviour which puts one's very soul itself in mortal jeopardy. That fateful evening when ten of us had sloped round to Bendy's house, his mother and father having gone out earlier, in order to make use of his father's new Betamax video player a device which had been purchased by Mr Henderson for the sole purpose of watching serious and sober documentaries. That fateful evening, when the real purpose of our immoral gathering had been to use Mr Henderson's new Betamax video recorder not to watch a serious or sober documentary, but instead a grainy and grubby film of a particularly dubious nature, which Bendy had borrowed from Gorper Alsop, who was notorious for being able to supply such salacious materials from the extensive collection he had found stashed and hidden in his dad's potting shed. And it was just as we had been viewing this unseemly spectacle, watching goggle-eyed, the mind-boggling, and, for boys of our age, hitherto unimaginable acts, that the recorder had suddenly, and completely without warning, jammed the picture freeze-framing on a highly provocative image. With growing frustration, we had tried all manner of remedies to get the film to play again. Gently tapping on the Betamax video recorder, violently banging on the video recorder, changing the channels, turning the TV on and off. But every time, the screen had simply lit up and filled with the same lewd and licentious frozen act, and eventually we had had to accept that the film itself was faulty. But it was when we went to actually remove the tape from the video player that we had found, to our absolute horror, that it was somehow stuck in the machine. Desperately, we struggled to get the cassette out, but to no avail. And it was then that we heard the sound that sent the mother of all shivers down our spines. 
the purring of Mr. Henderson's Ford Cortina estate car coming back down the drive, returning early. Blind panic had then ensued. Even more frantically and frenetically, we tried to get the tape out, but as we heard the car being garaged, Bendy, resigning himself to his destiny and not wanting his parents to catch all ten of us red-handed in the front room, had turned the TV off, turned to face us, and, looking at us all through his trademark milk bottle glasses, goofy teeth protruding, had nobly declared, It is a far, far better thing that I do than any I have ever done. Now quick, all of you lot, out of the back door. And like rats fleeing the sewer, the ten of us had piled out of the house, tearing up the drive as soon as we heard Mr. and Mrs. Henderson go through the front door and leaving Bendy to bravely face his fate. For the next half hour, Bendy had known that on the dormant screen that unexpurgated image lurked, waiting for him, hanging over him like the sword of Damocles and his fate had been duly sealed at precisely nine o'clock, when his father had switched on the television for the news, and, instead of seeing the saggy features of Peter Woods, had been confronted with the nude and supple body of a seductive Swedish actress, and the sagging, yet respondent flesh of a grey-haired German gentleman, wearing nothing at all but a black polo neck jumper, and smoking a dark cherry wood pipe. So, back to Bendy's room, on this the last night of his grounding, we were getting bored. Having already gone through his meagre record collection three times, and having spent 15 minutes or so throwing darts at one of his elder brother's Genesis posters, being boys of a mischievous bent, we needed some far more exciting means of entertainment. And as we were then racking our brains trying to think of a suitable caper, Bendy suddenly hit upon the brainwave. I know! Let's go fishing for the Butterfields carp! Now, the Butterfields were the Henderson's next door neighbours, and were a very unusual pair. Mr Butterfield, a suave and smooth-skinned sandy-haired seducer, with shiny eyes and a permanent saturation of Old Spice aftershave and Mrs. Butterfield, a buxom man-trap with a face like a mashed-up sponge cake, troweled on Mikado white makeup, whose choice of very tight and far too short dresses that she squeezed into made it seem as if she was concealing a pair of large water-filled balloons beneath her clothing when she was walking. This was a couple who, even though they were neighbours, Bendy's parents had as little to do with as possible. This was because of what Bendy's father referred to as the highly inappropriate and very peculiar practices indulged in by this couple, particularly at the very strange parties which they held at their house once a month. Parties that involved married couples leaving with completely different partners than those they had originally gone in with. Who knew exactly what went on behind the white stucco walls of the Butterfield's harem? Although, from the look of Mrs Butterfield's eye-catching and exotic underwear that hung free and loose on her washing line, one could only dread to guess. Now, within the Butterfield's high-hedged garden, there was a pond containing a collection of ornamental koi carp and we would sometimes take Bendy's fishing rod, which he kept hidden under his bed for this very purpose, climb out of his bedroom window onto the flat double extension roof, put a bit of bread on the hook as bait, and then cast our line into the Butterfield's pond. Although we had never actually managed to catch one of the elusive fish that swam in the pond's clear depths, we had come tantalisingly close on several occasions. So, all we needed now was some bait. Thus, under the pretext of needing a glass of water, Bendy went downstairs into the kitchen, where Mr Henderson and the vicar were in sombre and serious discussion. 
slid across to the bread bin, sneaked out a slice of sunblessed, and returned to the bedroom to join Stumpy and me. And then, rod in hand, we silently climbed out of Bendy's bedroom window onto the green felted double extension roof. Carrying from the park across the way came the sound of some local ruffians beating up Staplefoot the name caller. And from a nearby garden, we could just pick out the tinny tones of a transistor radio playing nice and sleazy by the Stranglers. We crept forward, checking to make sure the coast was clear. First, Bendy's back garden. Stumpy and I noticing that the lawn just in front of the extension had been dug up and replaced by a large pile of builder's sand and the footings and foundations for a new garden wall that was under construction. We then peered over the high hedge into the Butterfield's garden, which was completely silent and empty, save for a row of Mrs. Butterfield's saucy and substantial undergarments which sagged heavily on the washing line. We peered into their kitchen and dining room windows, checking for signs of life, also noticing that the cream-coloured curtains on both of their back bedroom windows were drawn. All clear, we signalled, and putting a flake of bread onto our hooker's bait, we got ourselves into position. Stumpy made the first cast, straight and true, fizzing over the high hedge, over the washing line, the bait and hook landing with a loud plop in the pond. We waited patiently. Just below the surface we could see the large orange forms of the carp gathering, one starting to rise, nearer to the bait, just under the bait, and then, just before Stumpy could strike, sucking the bread straight off the hook. Stumpy reeled in. We rebaited and now Bendy took his turn. Another great cast, fizzing over the high hedge, over the washing line, the bait and hook landing with a loud plop into the pond. Again, we watched one of the carp swimming towards the bait, rising to the bait, rising nearer to the sunblessed, taking the bait, Bendy striking, and yes, we had our fish, our great orange prize. The carp soared majestically out of the water, dangling heavily off the line, the rod bending under its weight. The only explanation that Stumpy and I could later give for what happened next was that Bendy, in his over-exuberance caused by the thrill of actually catching and trying to reel in this large fish, had jerked far too hard with his spidery arms. Consequently, as he did so, the fish flapped and flopped and fell off the hook, landing back in the water with a great splash. But the momentum of Bendy's violent strike continued to wildly yank the fishing line, whipping and whirling it through the air like some writhing nylon snake, the barbed hook on its end gleaming like a fang seeking some soft and succulent prey. And, a split second later, the hook found its quarry, one of Mrs. Butterfield's huge flame-red brassiers that was hanging on the washing line as large as a Roman catapult. The hook, sinking into this oversized object, snapped it free from the wooden pegs and pulled it off the washing line and up towards us like some monstrous and terrible satin-red death's head moth. For one appalling moment, it seemed as if this outlandish entity was actually going to reach, hit, cover, smother and engulf us. But the great weight of the bra caused the fishing line's impetus and flight path to alter. The bra lost altitude, failed to clear the top of the hedge, dragged and snagged along its thorny top and eventually came to a tangled halt in the foliage. The immediate panic now over, Bendy gave a short tug to reel in the ample bra, then another, then Stumpy and I both took turns and the three of us realised that the plenteous brassier was stubbornly staying stuck in the top of the hedge. Now we had a problem. For even though we knew that the easiest way of freeing the oversized bra was to go down to Bendy's father's garage, get out his stepladder 
and climb up the hedge. With Bendy's father and the vicar in the kitchen, this was impossible. We knew that instead, one of us had to get down off the roof and somehow try to remove the bra. And, being the boy who had made the fateful catch, and being by far the one with the longest arms, there was only one candidate for this role. Thus Bendy, with moral support from Stumpy and me, went to the edge of the extension roof, turned round, saluted us, squatted down, and, grabbing hold of the rough green felt of the edge of the extension roof with both hands, silently lowered himself down, eventually hanging from the rooftop by two long arms. Then, still hanging on by his left arm, he swung his right arm backwards, grabbing at and then grabbing hold of the bra first time, trying to work and manipulate it free. Meanwhile, as I very quietly directed operations to try to give more leverage to Bendy's attempts, Stumpy had picked up the fishing rod, pulling it at an extreme right angle, making the line go tight and taut. Sometimes in life, events can conspire against you in a combination of bad timing and bad luck. And at such moments, it can seem that the universe itself is involved in some great and dark conspiracy against you. The next moments represented one of these perfect storms of misfortune. For just at the very moment that our attempts at liberating the voluminous bra were successful, Bendy having managed to ungrapple and free it from the hedge, and Stumpy having swung the rod rightwards with great force, the giant red bra hanging off its end, the kitchen back door opened and Mr Henderson and the vicar walked out into the back garden, taking a break from their serious and sombre religious discussions in order for Mr Henderson to show the vicar the progress of his under construction garden wall. The sound of his father's and the vicar's unwanted appearance and the resulting looks of horror on my face and Stumpy's immediately caused Bendy to panic, and as he swung his right arm forward to try and grab onto the extension roof, he missed the edge of the roof, grasping instead the black plastic guttering a few inches below it. For some inexplicable reason, possibly to create equilibrium, this in turn caused him to lose his grip with his other hand, which also slipped off the edge of the extension roof onto the plastic guttering, now leaving him hanging from it by both long arms. This commotion caused Mr Henderson and the vicar to spin round, and they now stared and glared up at the astonishing spectacle that confronted them. Bendy Henderson, hanging off the guttering like the elasticine man, his arms seemingly getting longer by the second, and his co-conspirators, Stumpy Sanderson and me, standing stunned and speechless, Stumpy with the fishing rod still in his hand, Mrs Butterfield's enormous bra hanging off its end. The vicar looked incredulously from behind his wire-rimmed glasses, while Mr Henderson's strict Presbyterian features were filling with a combustible mixture of retribution and reckoning. It was a clear prelude to the thunder and wrath that was surely coming our, and particularly his hanging son's, way. What on earth are you playing at, lad? Get down from that guttering immediately! Stumpy and I still do not know to this day if some supernatural force was at work in influencing Bendy's literal interpretation of his father's instruction to get down from that guttering immediately because even though he had only been hanging from it for a few moments, and even though he was only a pencil-thin boy, the weight of his reedy physique was still far too much for black plastic guttering with inadequate wall fixings to bear. And with a horrible snapping and cracking sound, the guttering suddenly started to pull away from the wall. 
as Stumpy and I looked on, transfixed, as Bendy began to bend away from us. Bendy just had time to call out to us. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than any I have ever known. And before his father could rush forward to try and stop him, and as the guttering came away completely from its fixings to the wall, Bendy fell outwards and backwards, travelling the short distance and landing with a large thump straight onto his back into the pile of builder's sand. A Stumpy and I peered down from the extension roof at Bendy's outstretched form. Mrs Butterfield's bra, miraculously and suddenly loosened by all the tugging and pulling it had recently been subjected to, dropped off the end of the hook, fluttering and descending towards the prostrate Bendy, its straps flapping in the wind, making it look like some falling flame-red angel. But it was caught, just before it reached its destination, by the large outstretched hand of Mr Henderson. As Mr Henderson stood there, looming large over the fallen figure of his son, Mrs Butterfield's enormous flame-red bra in his hand, the vicar still looking on incredulously from behind his wire-rimmed glasses, Stumpy and I became aware of a sound from next door. Spinning round, we saw that the cream-coloured curtains of one of the Butterfield's bedroom windows were drawn back. The bedroom window was open, and standing there was Mr Butterfield, that sandy-haired seducer, and Mrs Butterfield, that buxom man-trap, both of them giggling, both in a state of undress that was shielded only by what looked like a skimpy silk sheet wrapped around them, and we heard Mr Butterfield call down, I say, Mr Henderson, when you've finished with my wife's bra, you wouldn't mind popping it back round to us, would you? Looking down at Mr Henderson, whose face was by now turning the same colour as the maleficent brassiere he was holding, Stumpy and I both realised that our presence would have little bearing on the terrible judgments to come. And we thus took this opportunity to begin furtively creeping back towards Bendy's open bedroom window, through which we could climb and make our dignified exit. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories. And don't forget to listen out for Stumpy and Gang's next adventure. For further information on all things Stumpy Sanderson, please visit www.stumpysanderson.co.uk And you can also check out the Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Stories YouTube channel. But before we saddle up again on our rally choppers and tomahawks, let's take a listen to the strange little song that was specially written by Stumpy to accompany this podcast's tale. This song is performed for us now by Stumpy Sanderson's 1970s Acoustic Archive. Let's rock! We walked along those mean streets Their jackets on our backs Bondage trousers, safety pins And eight hole DM boots Followed all our favourite groups Stranglers, Pistols, Clash Banshees and the Damned Buzzcocks and the Jam When we were punks When we were punk When we were punks When we were punk We bought our guitars from Woolworths Started up our bands Rolled our songs, expressed our thoughts, devised and arcing plans We followed all our favourite groups Stranglers, Pistols, Clash Banshees and the Damned Buzzcocks and the Jam When we were punks When 
we were punk When we were punks When we were When we were punks When we were punk When we were punks When we were punk We had such good times